Live from the Javits Center in New York City, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2017. Brought to you by Infor. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Inforum. I am your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Dave Vellante. We're joined by Terry Wise. He is the Vice President of Alliances for AWS. Thanks so much for coming on the program again. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks, you see you. So we are now um, a, a few years into this relationship with Infor. Uh, mm -hmm. Where are we? We're, 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 put things in perspective for us. Oh, that's a great question. I, I think uh, in, in some respects, this is you know, arguably the most mature and strategic relationship we have. We've been working with uh, Infor for, I've been at Amazon now nine years, and the better part of my nine years, we've been working with Infor, you know, or in the early days it was Lawson before Infor uh, bought the company. And uh, they've always done a great job of pushing us to be more enterprise-centric, more innovative in our platform and services. So it's very mature from that perspective. But I'd say also at the same time, you know, we're just entering a whole new day. It's we, we like to call it day one at Amazon. Uh, and if you look at some of the things that uh, Charles and the team announced today with Coleman and some of the new functionality and the growth of the cloud, I mean, we really are still at the at the early stages of this relationship, which is which is exciting. You know, what was interesting to me, Terry, is um, you know Andy always talks about the flywheel. He was sort of the first to uh, use that terminology. And I was sitting in the analyst meeting yesterday and Infor was going through its architecture. And I just saw a lot of flywheel in there. I mean, there was DynamoDB in there. I certainly saw S3. I think, I think there was Kinesis in yeah. terms of time series stuff. Uh, I think I saw Redshift in there. And, and so I wonder if you could talk about how this company specifically, but generally how people are leveraging that flywheel of innovation to, uh, to drive value for their customers. Yeah, and again, I think this goes back to the relationship we've had with Infor for so, so many years. It's, it's, you know, cloud is not just about cheap compute and storage, it's really about platform and innovation that comes from that platform. And, you know, and partners and customers like Infor that have been with us a while, and they, you know, they've got the skill sets internally, they've got you know, great vision for where they want to take their customers with application functionality. They're really ripe to be able to take advantage of all of the innovative platform services we built. Kinesis, Lambda for serverless computing. We're talking about some neat things around Edge. You heard uh, Charles and Duncan today talk about Lex and some of the AI uh, capabilities we have that are underpinning Coleman and some of their new offerings. Um, so they really are kind of the poster child for adopting our new services and driving innovation on top of our platform for their customer base. So where, if you can um, look into your crystal ball a little bit, where will we be a year from now, three years from now from, with these technologies? Ah, so if I look out a year, I think, uh, you know, rapid global expansion. Um, you know, we're long past in many respects sort of the, the early, questions around cloud. Right. Is it secure? Is it cost effective? Is it robust and reliable? And we're really past that if I look at, you know, across the globe. And now it's a question of how can we help enterprises adopt faster? And that's really the probably the single biggest question I get from enterprise customers is, this is great, help me move quicker. And I think one of the th neat things about the Infor relationship is because they've packaged all of this innovation into a set of business applications they're actually helping customers move to the cloud quite a bit faster and get that great value prop of cost uh, efficiency, security, innovation, et cetera. Well, looking out three years, I think uh, uh, Duncan and the team did a very nice job today talking about the interaction and user experience of how you're going to uh, engage with business software moving forward. It's going to be very voice driven. It's going to be predictive in nature, so it's actually going to tell you what you need to think about versus going to a terminal or even a mobile device. Um, so much left to do in that space. But I really do think uh, you know, three years from now, machine learning won't be a buzzword, nor will artificial intelligence. It'll just be a bigger part of our daily lives. We were talking to Chip Coyle a little bit about trying to debunk some of the myths in, in cloud, specifically Amazon cloud. And I mentioned Oracle saying that core enterprise apps really aren't going to the cloud, that's why you need Oracle, and they've got a strategy to do that, you've seen it. Um, but then you see Infor, 55% of their business is in your cloud. They look like core enterprise apps, so is it 
My question is, help us debunk that myth, but is it narrowly confined to companies like Infor or are there examples of, of others? I mean, certainly there are companies, you guys have the unbelievable logo chart, but you know, when you peel back the onion, much, many of those apps are cloud native or emerging apps, but those core of enterprise apps, we're seeing it from Infor, I wonder if you could add some color to that, and are there other examples? Absolutely, I mean, uh... Yeah, I think there's others in, in the market that may be uncomfortable with the, the change that's happening with cloud and therefore might be incented to try to slow that down. Uh, but I would say the vast majority of all software companies we're engaging with are moving mission critical enterprise apps to AWS, some built natively in SaaS, uh, like Infor has done, others that are enabling certifying their applications. Uh, SAP is another good example. Uh, you can kind of go across the stack Adobe, Autodesk, uh, there's just you know Siemens PLM for product lifecycle management. I mean, if you think about, you know, that's putting company's core IP, the product development, into the cloud to take advantage of all of this agility, scale, cost savings, et cetera. So it's it's been happening for a long time. A Dassault is another great one, very very innovative, but somewhat conservative French company. Uh, they were very early on in the journey with us, and again, that's you know. Uh, IP used to design airplanes, the things we fly around in. So it's been happening for a long time, it's accelerating. And I, I would say the other trend we're seeing is, is the companies out there that are resisting. We're hearing more and more from customers that, hey, that company's not helping move me to the future. Can you help me find an alternative? So there's this big movement for enterprises to actually migrate out of legacy platforms, whether that's hardware or software, and move into more cloud-native platforms, which are the future. So, we, we see, we've been talking on theCUBE for years about this whole digital transformation and, and how it's going to allow companies to play in different industries. Amazon, obviously, retailer, just purchased Whole Foods, getting into grocery, it's a content company. Uh, so, Walmart uh, said, all right, we're not going to put our stuff in the, in the Amazon cloud. Netflix obviously does. How do you deal with that the obvious competitive fears of some of the customers that you have for AWS. How do you message that, and you know, what do you tell the sure. world? Sure, well, the first thing is, I mean, AWS, you know, while it is part of Amazon.com, I mean, we are a separate operating group, and we've been that way you know, since the beginning. Um, so we, you know, Amazon is a customer, just like Netflix or Nordstrom, uh, or any of the other you know, millions that we serve. Now they're very, hard customer <laughs> and a very good customer <laughs> and they help drive our innovation roadmap, but we don't treat them any differently than we do you know, Netflix or the others. Um, and part of that has to do with how we you know, protect and secure uh, the information that those companies put on AWS. So there's some companies out there, uh, the one you just mentioned that still may be a bit uncomfortable um, uh, for whatever reasons, competitive reasons, putting information or having third parties put information related to their business on AWS. And yeah, I think that's um, unfortunate. Uh, I think, and it also talks about two different philosophies. Uh, we take very much a customer-centric view of the business, what's best for the customer. And if one of our partners has a better uh, capability, um, We've got plenty of partners that have similar products to what we offer, but if it's the better product for the customer, we're more than happy to support that. Whereas others out there take a very competitive focus to the market. Uh, where it's, they're watching what their competitors are doing, they're trying to head them off at the pass, or copy what their competitors are doing. In long term, I don't think that's a fantastic strategy, because you're never really innovating on behalf of the customer. You're never giving them the best solution. You're actually preventing them from getting something that could be beneficial to that customer. And uh, I, we just don't believe that's a, a long-term great business strategy for our customers and for, our, for ourselves. We recently saw the, the announcement of Amazon purchasing Whole Foods. Can you talk a little bit about this for our viewers and, 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 and talk about where how you see the future of, of grocery and retail and where it's going? Sure, so, so we've announced our intentions to purchase Whole Foods. <laughs> it has not happened, um, so there's, there's, there's still some more work to do there. But I think um, you know, anytime we look at you know, how we're going to expand either organically or through acquisition, it's about where are there synergies between our existing business, what the customer is looking for, and how can we create a better experience for that customer. And how, how can we do it at scale? 
how can we innovate around that model? Uh, and then, you know, how, do, how can we make that a great long-term experience for the customer that then ultimately drives the success and growth of our business, but also the partners that we bring in, whether again through acquisition or through third-party partnership. I think this is kind of a, if you look at this, this is a bit of a natural uh, move as we look to, you know, when our customers are telling us, hey, make it easier for us to purchase groceries and household items, you know, the way, and do it in a hybrid way, both, you know, combination of online and more from a physical presence. Terry, I wonder if you could talk about, you mentioned the edge before, and, and as you build out your partner strategy and the partner ecosystem, talk more about the edge, um, where it fits, edge at the, an, analytics at the edge, uh, and, and Amazon being the cloud, so how, what's your point of view on what happens at the edge, what moves back to the cloud, the expense of moving things back to the cloud? What's your thought on, on that whole thing? Well, there, there, there's so many use cases for edge computing. I mean, you take the mining industry. I mean, you're putting huge trucks in the middle of nowhere that may have limited or very expensive connectivity. And they're capturing all kinds of you know, information during the natural oper operation of that machine. And it just makes sense that you want some level of data processing, storage, and analytics to happen on that machine. It could be a cruise ship, it could be a naval vessel, it could be an airplane. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's you know, lots and lots of different applications there. But by doing some of that processing at the edge, uh, you're actually limiting the amount of data you have to send back to the central cloud. Uh, but of course, if you want to take full advantage of the analytics, you actually have to match that data up with all the historical data and other real-time data that's, that's um, uh, resident in the cloud to get the result you're looking for. So it really becomes you know, kind of this hybrid computing model. And so some of it is efficiency around how much data you're sending back and forth. Some of it is just efficiency around processing uh, the point uh, uh, of data capture. Uh, some due to connectivity reasons, some due to other. But, uh, it really is kind of this interesting new extension of hybrid cloud, if you will. We're very excited about it. So, and, and you've made some moves in that area. I mean, Snowball was, I think, you know, yep. one of the first, and there are other sort of edge, what I would consider edge-like you know, devices or, or solutions. Mm -hmm. um, you, how dogmatic are you about <laughs> everything living in the cloud? I mean, those are steps. Should we expect, you know, increasingly you, extending the reach of the cloud, or is it just really going to all, in your, your world, come back to the AWS clouds? Yeah, yeah. It'll certainly be an extension of, of the cloud. There, that's already been happening. Yeah, I mean, if you look at hybrid cloud, and I think um, we've always been a supporter of hybrid cloud. If you look at our roadmap going back many, many years with virtual private cloud, with direct connect, with some of the, uh, the newer uh, capabilities like Snowball, and of course, Greengrass, our edge capabilities. Right, right. Yeah, we're really extending the reach out to be much more of a hybrid story because we recognize that you know, not all the data today exists in the cloud or AWS. In the future, you know, we think most applications will run in the cloud because the value proposition is so strong across so many different dimensions. But today there's plenty of other places we have to connect to, again, to capture the data. Uh, now I do think the vast majority of the data that we're capturing will be either pre-processed or sent natively into AWS to create a, a massive data lake so that you can start to drive these innovative machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. You know, the predictive uh, analytics, the algorithms, they just don't work if you don't, uh, they don't work effectively if you don't have massive amounts of data and you continuously refresh that data so that the algorithms can continue to learn. And you, and you, I want to double click on something you said about the value. The, to, to capture most of the value, you, your, your belief is that it's going to be in the cloud, one cloud, um, and, and others uh, obviously have different view for a variety of different reasons. I buy the cost argument, and you didn't make that argument, I'm making it, the marginal cost of having a single cloud you know, standard homogeneity is, is superior, I'll, I'll grant that. What else is there though? Is it speed, is it innovation, is it standardization across the, the base? Uh, the, single biggest, the single biggest value that I hear from customers today, well they love it, they love the cheap hosting piece, the efficiency part of it, but it really is the speed and agility. Um, it's certainly the, the security model as well. Uh, I would say that you know, most, almost every organization now that we talk to, 
once we've had a chance to you know, educate them if they haven't already done so themselves, you know, has determined that the cloud computing security model is much more effective than they could deliver on their own. We can just invest more, we can experiment more, we can have multiple certifications across different industries, which every customer gets to take advantage of. Um, but I would, I would, I would just come back, it's the ability to move quickly. Whether it's moving into new market, I mean, I was just in Europe we were talking about, and it's, there's, it's so volatile there right now on so many dimensions with Brexit and some of the nationalistic politics things that are happening. Um, you know, potentially the opening up more of um, uh, the Middle East with the sovereign wealth funds coming into play. There's just so much opportunity that enterprises need to be able to move quickly. And if they have to go stand up a data center somewhere else or they can't deploy the software quickly, they're, they're at a competitive disadvantage. So the single biggest driver from what I hear from customers and what I'm seeing is agility. Yeah, okay, and so just to clarify, I said it's cost, not price, but we can debate that some <laughs> other time. Uh, you just came back from Europe, uh, you mentioned Brexit. What about like, things like GDPR, which has taken effect, but the penalties go in effect May of 18. Mm -hmm. Obviously that puts a lot of pressure on the cloud provider as well as your customers. What are you hearing in Europe and, and generally and specifically GDPR? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would say the, the regulatory environment everywhere, but specifically in Europe, continues to evolve and is fairly fluid. Uh, we've spent many years working with the various different uh, regulatory bottles, the Art Article 29 Working Party that's actually been crafting a lot of this legislation. Um, so we're heavily influencing because if you step back, people said you couldn't do cloud, but they didn't explicitly, explicitly say you could. <laughs> so there's a, you know so customers are meant to how do I interpret this and some you know like if I look at Enel and I look at Society Generale and I look at uh, you know BMW and some of you know our forward leaning European customers uh, Siemens is another great one who was one of the original companies to put PII in the cloud here's a big German company putting PII in AWS a number of years ago so we figure out how to get not get around but interpret. Uh, the regulations, and then also ensure that we've got the features and capabilities to make sure that they comply with those regulations. So the full audit trail, the ability to encrypt data, uh, the ability to make sure that you know data storage and localization is compliant with what, whether it's a um, country level regulation or an industry level regulation. So we continue to spend a lot of time and effort monitoring and influencing uh, that and then building the services to make sure our customers are Well, you've always done well with permutations and complexity and, mm -hmm. and automating that, so it's going to be fun to watch. It, it will indeed. Yeah. Great. Terry, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. We will have more from Inforum just after this.